Hi, everyone, and welcome to another panel here at the fourth annual Panagora Pharma CX Tech Summit. This panel is a group of experts that we've gathered together. One you've just seen presents on platforms and the others that were gathered here to talk about very similar content, get some extra opinions, get some extra perspectives on that as well. So uh, I'm going to let you guys introduce yourselves. Uh, let's start with Jim because everyone just got done watching your presentation. Fantastic, sir. Why don't you tell any newcomers who you are and what you do? Oh, great. Thanks, Seth. Uh, Jim Lefevre. I'm an uh, international business leader uh, for digital partnering solutions uh, with Roche Diabetes Care. I've been with Roche for 20 years, uh, which I always uh, get a little shocked when I say that. Um, it certainly <laughs> has been felt like 20 years. Uh, but all, all my entire career has all been in uh, the commercial side, marketing, digital marketing, digital strategy, uh, and most recently, innovation and product development. And Steve, say hello. Hello, I'm Steve Peretz, and I'm with uh, App Innovation. And overall, we focus on patient-centric solutions, so how to identify and validate the right types of ideas with our actual customers, and then how to bring them to life through the whole gamut and digital solutions of UX, design, tech. And Mary? And I'm Mary Laster. I work for Bayer on their digital platform team that's representing the U.S. Excellent. So the title of this panel, or subtitle, if you will, Most Healthcare Apps Fail, But Yours Doesn't Have To. And uh, having been in the industry for the last 10, 12 years, I've seen a lot of healthcare apps come and go. Healthcare technology ideas come and go, however you want to characterize those. So we'll be talking about that, some keys to success for uh, launching an app or healthcare technology, uh, but also a lot of the other ideas, do's and don'ts, and other aspects of that subject. So very, very easy question to start out with because I don't think there's any right or wrong answer here. How do you serve your patients beyond the pill? So, Steve, how do you how do you serve your patients beyond the pill? What does that even mean? Sure. Yeah, well, the pill plus movement, right? Um, so it starts with patient support, and there's a couple key themes of what beyond the pill at least means to us. Um, patient support being the biggest theme across conditions. Uh, we look at focusing on how we can address that blind spot uh, when the patient isn't they're not always with their doctor. And there's a lot of moments where, you know, we don't know what's going on. So digital can really come in and help there. And that really starts with health literacy. So if the patient can't even understand the condition, how likely are they to be motivated to actually actively manage it? And just to put that into perspective, according to United Health Group, um, there's about a $25 billion problem right now with health literacy, literacy and that's in the US alone. So, we support patients through those critical moments along their journey, uh, not just while they're taking a pill or at the doctor's office. And the irony is that when we do that really well, we're actually able to demonstrate some business goals, uh, how we've actually encouraged discussions with, you know, between a patient and a doctor about treatment options and medication adherence, which has obviously been a big theme today as well. Um, and then just a quick example of how we try to put this pill plus movement into practice. One of our clients had a challenge of getting patients to understand their risk of stroke once diagnosed with uh, AFib. And when there was a lack of understanding of the risk, patients were unmotivated to seek, you know, or consider any treatment options. We built an app, in this case an app. Uh, we'll talk about why not always do you have to think about an app, but in this case it was an app. And it was a shared decision-making platform that empowered patients to be more involved in the conversation with their doctors. So the app facilitated the conversations through an algorithm, and it produced a risk score to help physicians and patients better understand their risk, but you know, really what to do about it and understand what the treatment options can be. So rather than immediately just shoving a treatment option down a patient's throat, 
how do you involve the patient in the process? So that way you're actually going beyond the pill itself, right? And the beauty of that is that this app is now in some cl clinical trials to determine how effective digital solutions like this could be in those critical intervention points. So you're talking about uh, beyond the pill being once the medication is uh, prescribed or given, looking at what happens afterwards. Mary, do you have a similar or different definition of beyond the pill? Yes, so coming from more of a marketing side or inherent side, I look at great customer experience. So with personalized messages at the right time. And what this can be is I kind of think of when you go to the pharmacy or now if you're going to CVS, Rite Aid or one of those major pharma, a lot of times they have their apps that you can get on and they know what you're on. And when you think about that, uh, basically when you're given that medication, uh, they actually send you text messages now to remind the customer or the patient um, when you need to take the medication, how to take it. Uh, and they send it now through you know, multiple channels. So when you think of that app, you start there, but then it's also push notifications. It can be SMS, it can be email. And they actually see where you know the patient is most likely, what channel. And so that it could be a simple message, uh, for instance, a text message. Right before in the morning, uh, the customer needs to take the pill, the patient needs to take the pill. Uh, they get a text message with a simple video, a one minute video. Hey, here's tips and tricks of how to help uh, with the best absorption or um, when do you need to take your multivitamin? These are just simple tricks that can be, you know, put into, you know, the app, but also integrated into your marketing as well and adherence plans. So taking that a little bit of a, not necessarily a step further, but expanding it laterally with regards to the blind spot that occurs, uh, blind spots uh, that occurs after the drug is prescribed and the 362 days that you're not with your doctor. Uh, or not going to see your doctor throughout the year. Jim, beyond the pill, your thoughts? Yeah, so I, and I love the support and I love the, the marketing, and I'm gonna actually maybe go uh, a few steps back and uh, suggest that the initial customer insight, uh, really truly understanding the, the job to be done before you create anything, um, you know, from an innovation perspective is uh, something that can help prevent uh, building something that fails at, at launch. And so deeply understanding the customer, deeply understanding uh, how to correct or, or fill a pain point that they might have. And then during the development innovation process, uh, make sure that you have milestones and that you are running uh, research, generating real world evidence that um, continually demonstrates and shows to you that what you have built and what you are building uh, meets the needs of the customers. Um, you know, that goes a significant way in terms of handling or, or, or trying to uh, not launch something uh, that will fail at launch. But I love the, uh, the idea of the support and the marketing because I think in combination, if you are thinking about and doing all of those things, then you are significantly de-risking uh, the odds of uh, failure. That sounds almost like before beyond the pill, right? trying exactly. to think about what's going on. So um, that's the next question that I was gonna ask you guys is that, uh, you know, what are some strategies that would give your app or technology platform or tech technology intervention a better chance for success. So Jim, you mentioned um, you know, the initial customer insight and putting the problem first and trying to figure that out. We had some folks earlier in the day talk about a lot of people going around with solutions looking for problems. And right, if you have a hammer, everything is a nail. Um, but can you expand on that with regards to the initial customer insight or what are some other strategies that would give uh, your technology effort a greater chance to succeed? Well, I think um, it starts with uh, that deep understanding and uh, from a uh, kind of a customer insight perspective, making sure that you have uh, really rich, deep information. Uh, How do you get that? You, well, whether you wanna call it personas or archetypes or you know, whatever disease condition that you work in, truly understanding all aspects uh, of that individual that may be taking that drug, um, how they live, 
Um, and it could be, you know, literally identifying somebody and following them around for 48 hours, but truly getting a deep appreciation um, for the issues that they may have. Um, hour to hour so looking at uh, not only data, but also maybe some first person research, some actual observation and, and, you know, boots on the ground type of, of uh, insight that you can get back from that. Mary, Definitely how so can my app be a success? What type of strategy or advice would you give uh, to myself as a young aspiring app maker that wants to solve a problem in the healthcare space? I'm gonna look at an organization of how do you make it successful? And when you think about it, you gotta have a great customer experience both internally within the organization and externally. So it's gotta be simple and easy to use. Um, so you got to incorporate design thinking. So design thinking from who's going to be using it within the organization, those brand marketers, uh, the IT, the data and analytics folks. Is it going to be easy enough for them to set up within? And then you got to be thinking externally, those that are going to be using it, the patients, the customers, the HCPs, whoever it is. And is it going to flow seamlessly and be easy and simple for them to use? And is it going to make sense within their day when they're going to use it? Um, so you can think of that CVS with the follow-up reminder, you know, is it relevant? So, okay, it was in the morning that the medication was supposed to be delivered. Uh, is it relevant? Does it make sense? Is it a manual that they have to read or is it a simple video? So thinking about those different logics along the way, how you're going to be delivering and allowing them to use that. So when you talk about simplicity, for both the organization as well as the patient, obviously, in this case, a patient facing solution. Do you think it's easier to sell the idea upwards if uh, if it's simpler to get Definitely. support from, uh, you know, the folks that you need on Mount Olympus to make it happen? Most definitely. The simpler it is, the easier you're going to get a buy-in from the organization. And how is it going to solve their problem? Where's the win-win? Um, you know, obviously, the more entrenched it is, the harder it is to use, the harder it is to get everybody else along that food chain that needs to be deploying that app uh, to use it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just thinking that, yeah, the, the easier it is for them to understand, the easier it is you're going to get funding, you'll be able to get approvals, all that kind of stuff, get support within the organization, as well as the folks in the organization that are using it. Steve, three... Yeah strategies to give your app a better chance for success yeah or i do like this theme that we're gravitating towards on simplicity and just want to share a quick case study of how to put that into practice um so you know to jim's point um you know sometimes people might rush into oh this needs to be an app or here's the technology here's the solution but really first looking at the patient problems right so how do you actually go about doing that we take a lot of pride in uh, what we call lean research. We call it lean because the term research can often be very scary, especially in pharma. It can sound like six month process, six figures to, to get off the ground. Um, so, you know, we were able to call it that because if you look at Nielsen, they said that the point of diminishing returns on getting user feedback is, is five, five people. Um, so if you do get the right five patients, in the right uh, audience and stuff, you know, the demographics and everything, then you actually would have something substantial. So in practice, we had a pharma client um, and they wanted to create an app in the oncology space. And the biggest thing is they really wanted more confidence to know that what they were doing, you know, was worth the financial investment. So they looked to a lot of market research, but the biggest gap that we saw, and you know, we, we always use this buzz term, patient centricity, is if you want to know if a patient will use your app, ask the patients, ask your, your sample patients. Um, so what that ends up turning into is what we call desirability testing. So the possibility of testing the app in its concept stage um, to understand what the patient would actually use, what they're currently using, maybe where there are some gaps, learn that early on rather than doing some usability testing late stages. You can always win on usability testing. Um, you know, to, to Mary's point too, like, will someone click the, the button? You know, that makes it easy enough to use, but will they actually download your app or whatever type of solution it, it is? You know, you need to make sure that there's that desirability. 
Um, so really, other than that, I think one of the most interesting strategies that we found to be curious too from Mary and Jim is, um, you know, to really give yourself a good chance of success, start small. Um, small where it's significant enough to be differentiated in the market. Will, will this be needed in the market or is this already in existence? And is it something that your patient might use either daily or, or definitely? But then we found that if the idea is overly complex, it becomes a little too overwhelming for the organization, it either doesn't get off the ground or it just never makes it to launch. Gotcha. Uh, going back to what you said about testing the usability with patients or, or actual users who happen, whoever that would happen to be, is that something that uh, your organization would do? Does the brand or the uh, you know, parent company do that, or do you outsource it to a market research, or you just kind of just wing it? Like, how does that work? Where do you find the patients to, I'm just curious how that works. Like, where do you find the patients to do the testing? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. very fair. Um, so I think Jim might have touched on it in his last presentation about platforms and having that mindset. Um, we often will, and, and part of that mindset, he talked about advocacy and partnerships. So sometimes we're fortunate where our clients or, or we have certain relationships with advocacy organizations that can provide the exact patient type. If not, there's some great groups out there like Schlesinger that will rely on. It's a third party. They'll find not only find the patients, but go to that due diligence. The reason five works is you really make sure it's it's someone that has the condition actively managing or not you know like exactly what you're looking for to find them but what we really specialize in outside of that recruiting is running the research right so what stimuli are you using and this whole adoption of lean research will design in figma meaning that we can actually in real time um, make updates based on what our patients are telling us and if you're not making updates then you're not evolving because people aren't using it. So, That's right. Uh, good stuff there. I have a, if we were live, I would just ask the studio audience to raise their <laughs> hands if everyone had been in a situation where somebody said, make an app. We need an app. Usually, uh, you'd, nowadays you would say, for what, for why? Why do we need an app? Uh, right. Back in the day, you would just whip up an app and, and uh, get it out there because you were told to do it. Um, and that's why a lot of these things fail. But if, if apps aren't the answer for you, then, then what other type of digital products, solutions, platforms are available? So, um, you know, again, uh, piggybacking off Jim's prior presentation, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what other options are out there, and then also uh, tell us a little bit about exactly the technology, uh, the diabetes technology with which you work. Um, so, kind of playing off, um, you know, the platform idea. Uh, you know, for me, I think uh, innovation uh, can come from really anywhere, and so certainly uh, internally to the organization, but then also externally to the organization. And that's where I think the uh, partnering and really understanding deeply kind of the, how startups, you know, in regardless of the, the disease condition that you work in, how are startups trying to tackle different problems? Uh, I think is very important uh, and deeply understanding that. And by doing so, I think you can understand how that in combination with perhaps assets that you have uh, in your organization or combination of, of products um, bundled together can create something net new. And so I often talk about, um, you know, either one plus one equaling three or two plus two equaling five, is that when you bring together a combination of solutions, uh, you are not only is that innovation, um, but it is also creating new value. Uh, and, and if you are doing so in a way that you're bringing things together that solves a customer problem in a new and unique way, then you have a new product, you have a new innovation, and you are um, able to bring something uh, new to the market. Um, I think, I, I just think about the payers and the IDNs and how they literally have hundreds, if not thousands of people calling on them 
uh, trying to bring their solution uh, to that hospital network, to that system, and how difficult that must be to manage. And if there is a way to be able to be a intermediary, intermediary for that and to bring solutions, and the key is to bring solutions with evidence. Uh, forward, I think then, you know, that is uh, really how you can win. Uh, the evidence, though, is the key um, and making sure that you are able, through that combination of products, making sure that you are able to improve outcomes. I think that's the uh, secret sauce. Do you, uh, do you have an example of that bundling or the one plus one equal three kind of situation that you described? Uh, um, for one that you my can share. Business, it, yeah, it would be a hardware device plus an app plus uh, something, and that could be, you know, anything. Um, but bringing these things together in a combination uh, that helps the patient either monitor, um, you know, in my case, uh, BG value, be able to store and track that uh, BG value, and then be able to share that with their physician. Um, and then over time, build a data profile that where they could um, understand highs and lows better, that gets shared with their physician and they could, you know, proactively, um, you know, perhaps intercede on a potential low or a situation. I mean, that would be a really high level example. So you also mentioned payers and IDNs and I'm going to throw this question out to everybody uh, in concurrently with, uh, you know, what are the options for apps? But when you think about it, if the drug that you're on, has an app and your hospital system has an app and your doctor wants you to use an app, but your insurance company also wants you to use an app, um, you know, which one is correct? Which one is one you should use? Are they, obviously they're not interoperable. Um, trying to be able to streamline that process and be able to have, uh, you know, one type of technology that would be appropriate rather than having five stinking diabetes apps that you're given for, you know, just one drug doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So when we think about that, Mary, uh, you know, what, what other types of options are out there, if not apps? And, you know, how could you solve for this app mania problem that you have with different sources of your healthcare responsibility? Definitely. So I think that this comes into when you think about how you bundle your app with other technology, that probably comes more into like that campaign space where how can we help progress or move that journey along of that patient? Uh, and one area that I looked at is both offline and online, what products work well um, with this is in a past uh, case study, we actually saw a cookbook for a diabetes franchise was actually something that patients called the support hotline asking for more cookbooks for their friends and family to support them in that journey. So looking at these little touch points along the way, um, so whether it's on the app or whether it's off the app, um, looking at that data and saying, hey, how can I best interact? Whether it's um, through that campaign or through the call center, how can we get all this data together? And how can we start to bundle all that information and start to roll it into an app or start to put it into that um, front facing uh, vehicle that the patient may be using. So did you digitize the cookbook and make a diabetes cookbook app that they can download? So eventually, yes, that'd probably be a good idea. But a lot of times folks like the actual paper copy for that cookbook, because when you're having to cook, if you think about what the patient's having to do, they probably have a hundred things going on. Having that paper on the table and just being able to read was what they wanted for that particular age group and that demographic. Now, I watch television. Everyone has a 13-inch iPad in their kitchen with an Alexa, so they can just shout out commands to it, right? So um, the digital cookbook would be perfect for that. Absolutely. Um, that's the next generation. But that's another example of personalization and just listening to the data coming back to you saying, like, no, they didn't want, you know, they wanted a hard, uh, a hard copy cookbook. So, uh, Steve from AppNovation, I guess if amps aren't the answer for you, you would just be Novation then. <laughs> right. What other types no, of very fair. Platforms um, can you 
Yes, a quick clarification. So uh, AppNovation stands for Applied Innovation, which we're quite proud of because it's the ability to apply the innovation of an idea. Um, oh, but well, always that's a lot like app. app innovation. So I was just uh, <laughs> yes, understood. Not not the end of the world. We are we are very proud of our ability to create apps as well. Um, um, really wild, Mary. I have the exact same experience for um, congestive heart failure, where the cookbooks were the hottest item, and it's a printout, right? Um, what we did do is we digitized it, where it was snackable content. So. Uh, rather than necessarily a full PDF of the entire cookbook, sometimes it came out in stages. You know, here's a great, you know, heart healthy blueberry oatmeal recipe. And there's a beautiful visual, sometimes a video like you talked about earlier, because very visual audience. Um, but a lot of chronic conditions, 55 plus, it, is it so surprising that sometimes they want to be complemented with printed materials? It's okay. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know that I have anything else to add really on the point of apps. I think I think the one thing is if, if you have a good enough idea, ideally if it can be like what Jim said of, of a platform where you are tapping into other things and it's not just one pharma company or brand talking at um, a patient, then it absolutely is worth uh, the download. It's it's about the simple experience that that Mary was suggesting. But lastly, you know, the first step is we, we try our best to actually convince ourselves and our clients of why not to do an app, because sometimes it means it's cheaper, it's faster, it's more efficient. Um, but there's often real legitimate reasons why you do need one if you need offline capabilities or, you know, native technologies that integrate with wearables and so on. But we actually try to convince ourselves and our clients first, does it need to be an app? If not, is there a website or another form of a digital program? And back in 2011, I said to a colleague of mine who worked for uh, an app maker, I said, apps are dead because we have microsites. They can do everything that apps can do. That was wrong. Um, so when looking at uh, bringing this into your organization, we only have about two minutes left. So a quick snippet about change management in an effort to grow that type of mindset within the organization or more or any thoughts about positioning uh, a digital product or solution internally to get buy-in and funding. We talked a little bit about that uh, with Mary and Simplicity. So Jim, change management, buy-in, funding. You mentioned a lot of things about, you know, doing all the homework up front and, and making sure that you have a good foundation, but, but uh, what parting words or phrases could you offer here? Yeah, I would just say, you know, start with the, the insight uh, and the, the problem uh, that you're trying to solve for that uh, patient. Uh, and then from a change management perspective, I mean, if you, if you follow that insight, um, I think it makes getting funding easier. Uh, if you're trying to move to agile, uh, I, I just always recommend you got to dive in feet first um, and get into it and kind of learn the hard way. Um, it's not really something that you can do, you know, academically by reading a book. You have to get in and start doing it uh, in order for it to take, take shape. Steve, change management, internal buy-in, funding, championing? Yes. Um, just real quick, the, the problem with change management is that, and Harvard Business Review would uh, back this up is that often it's 70% chance of failing. And the reason is it's often too big. We talk about transformation. Um, so often overwhelming, but um, some quick strategies to succeed, echoing Mary's point earlier about the simplicity. If you think about the hundred page decks that probably hit your inbox every day, that's, that's not really a recipe for success. Uh, how can you make it really simple in the message, elevator pitch, memorable, and then establishing a with them. So, What's in it for me? If you're trying to get a whole organization to adapt or just a department, how can you convince them that there's something that's in it for them aside from just a brilliant idea that you wanna uh, achieve? What's in it for the rest of the organization? And Mary. I'm gonna make this simple for you. Fail but fast, learn quickly. Fail fast, learn quickly. These are all great nuggets of advice that we can take back and use tomorrow in our everyday purviews. So great stuff coming out of this, thinking about where, when, how, why, 
to not only use, or sorry, design, build, affect the change for a tech, technology solution, but it could be an app, could be a platform, could be something else. Um, I thank you, our panelists, Mary, Jim, and Steve. Fantastic job. Great discussion. We are going to be moving into a networking break next. So you go back to the lobby, click into one of the four networking break sessions, and meet some of your fellow attendees. And then we will be back in half an hour with more great CX discussion. So we will see you in the networking sessions. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.